everyone, welcome to Down to Art. I'm your host, Christy Gordon, and today I'm joined by Raphael Hookstra, the founder of Artist Catalyst. So welcome, Raphael. Good to have you. Hi, Christy. Glad to join you. So Raphael has guided hundreds of artists in using Instagram optimally through webinars, workshops, and private consultations. And he's now teaching artists how to mint and market their NFTs in his NFT bootcamp. Um, so I'm so excited to talk to Raphael about these NFTs today. Uh, I'm sure everyone's like heard of NFTs at this point and um, for traditional artists that want to get into NFTs, it's so useful to have someone guide us. Um, so I guess, yeah, just like firstly, how did you get into NFTs, Raphael? Ooh, that takes us back to 2016 when I first got into Bitcoin. And then 2017, there was all kinds of craziness of all the new currencies. And then there's new things called NFTs. They actually came out 2015, but I only came across these 2017 and then started buying them, trading them. In those days, the hot collection was the Crypto Kitties, these little uh, pixelated cartoon cats. And the bizarre thing about them was that you could breed two cats together and make a new cat, which had traits of the parent cats. Quite bizarre and fun. <laughs> yeah, that's wild. Also, it's crazy to me that they actually started in 2017 or even 2015 when you heard about them in 2017. I didn't hear about them till like 2021. <laughs> so you were way ahead of the game as far as I'm concerned. Um, and that, yeah, that's really cool that you have also got experience in trading them. It, um, it's like cool to kind of know how they work in that way. Um, so yeah, what I guess like as far as traditional artists getting into NFTs, um, when I first heard about them, you know, last year I started to do like a lot of research, like I'm, I'm sure a lot of artists do. And um, there wasn't, it wasn't like that clear to me how they were really being perceived in the art world for like a traditional artist. And um, I didn't know too many people that were like, painters that were like making NFTs and actually I mean I think I was like I'm not ahead of the game but like a little bit at the beginning of the well not really the beginning beginning but um, I'm like mildly pleased that I wasn't right at the end or whatever trying to figure that out but I just had no idea um, and since then I've seen some artists like Jeremy Lipkin like doing NFTs and you know sometimes it's like a photo of his painting or like a new painting and you know I think he even sold one to a collector who already owned the painting and then he minted an NFT of that painting. And that's like a really cool technique. But um, I guess just basically what, what have you gathered about how it's like looking for traditional artists now to like get into NFTs? Like what, I don't know, <laughs> what have you seen? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm asked this question a lot. I think it's just a progression of technologies and uh, where people like to pick them up and adopt them, whether they're those really early adopters getting into something when it's so edgy, cutting edge, unknown, complicated, uh, when, they're, uh, when there's um, disbelief or negativity towards it as well. Uh, and you see this thing with like the internet, the World Wide Web in the 90s, and with social media, early 2000s, we kind of see this trend. Like some people are really early on Instagram, some people join <laughs> later on. Maybe yep. TikTok is the, the next thing. Yep. Oh, there's this new thing, TikTok. Oh, it's for the, just for the kids. Oh, it's too busy and complicated and fast. But maybe we said that about Instagram, maybe before that Facebook, maybe before that having a website. So it's a case of how conservative you want it to be. Do you want to wait until it's safe and everyone's doing it and it's totally normal? Or maybe there's pressure to, like, you've got to have a website these days. You've got to have an Instagram these days. Mm -hmm. Oh, you have to make NFTs these days. Do you want to wait until you've got to do it and it's totally normalized? Or do you want to lean forwards, be progressive, be at the cutting edge and, um, yeah, take a little risk, be a little edgy? Yeah. I think that's a, a kind of attitude question. And to be fair, hey, digital things, they're not going to be for every artist, and that's fine. Totally. Uh, to each their own. Um, I, I love a good oil painting. I'm not trying to convert everyone into NFTs here. But um, 
in, increasingly we are seeing clock crossover. So 2015, there was no crossover, purely digital, only for total dorks. Uh, but as this has progressed in the last seven years, we have seen a little bit of convergence in both directions, actually. Uh, digital NFT world coming towards fine art and traditional fine art coming towards NFTs. So there's overlap happening in different areas from both uh, camps moving towards each other. Mm -hmm. I find that encouraging to see. Totally. Yeah, I think that's interesting too. I, Yeah, I like recently met someone who runs a gallery in New York and they actually, it's the first time I've like, for me that I've like seen it, like where they have the screens up and they're selling NFTs and they also sell like original oil paintings and, um, you know, and so that that's like, that's cool to see. And, and obviously like Christie's and everything selling, the, you know, really big NFTs of people and stuff like that. Actually, I just realized we should probably back up. Do you want to try and explain what an NFT is as simply and clear, briefly as possible? <laughs> sure, sure, happy to. I guess yourself and myself, we take it for granted. Oh yeah, yeah. everyone knows what this three letter acronym is. <laughs> but, but not everyone perhaps. And even if some people have heard of it, it's still a bit vague, mysterious. I mean, it's understood. So sure, the way I like to, I mean, there's so many ways to explain it. We can go technical, but uh, the way I like to explain it, certainly to artists, is to say that there's different kinds of assets out there in the physical real world, and some are interchangeable. Something like dollars, one dollar is as good as another dollar. We can exchange them. You don't prefer one over the other. Uh, so too with gold bars. Many, many things like this, all the, all the currencies, really. And on the digital side, cryptocurrencies. One Bitcoin is as good as another Bitcoin. Yeah. All these things are called fungible, which is a Latin word. It comes from Latin. It sort of means uh, interchangeable, exchangeable. Kind of thing. On the other hand, or the other end of the spectrum, we have things that are not interchangeable. They're unique. And so those are things like Paintings, artworks, you can't just exchange one for another because they are unique. Uh, also, diamonds. Every diamond is unique in its clarity, brilliance, color, carrots, uh, all gemstones, in fact. Oh, true. And on the digital side, we have an, an analog of this also, which are that instead of... Um, some crypt most cryptocurrencies are fungible, exchangeable. We have the non-fungible tokens or cryptocurrencies, in which case each one is unique. Mm. They're one of, one of a kind. That is very cool. And that does like make me even now understand better this word fungible. I forget what I thought my friend was saying when he first told me about NFTs and fungible. It was like... Oh, it was fungible. I thought he had said non-fungible tokens, which is hilarious because it actually still makes sense. Like, it's almost like a casual way of saying fungible, non-fungible tokens. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, basically, it, it also, I guess, like, in my mind, very simply seems to be like a way of, um, actually, this is probably oversimplified, but as an artist, I think of it as a way of, like, making... Um, Kind of like it, not always though, not always a JPEG, sometimes like a movie or whatever, some kind of digital file in a way that makes it as if it's kind of like an original, like there's only one of it. Or if you make prints, then you set a certain number, but it's um, it's kind of like a, can you put that into words better? <laughs> do, do you yeah, know what absolutely. I'm saying? I, I, yeah. I, think word, I think the word you're looking for is scarcity or stock. Uh, yeah, uh -huh, exactly. Yeah, totally. Because that, that was something that I always felt like, um, I mean, I'm, I'm like a traditional artist and I love like the painting. I love the object. And um, there's a lot of like amazing digital art being done these days too. But I, for some reason, like, <laughs> I kind of like the whole scarcity thing. So it's kind of interesting how NFTs help make even like digital art, like ha have that scarcity kind of piece. It's interesting. Yeah. yeah it, 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 it. It brings something valuable to the digital world. 
Yeah. Because humans do this thing and they've been doing it for a few decades now. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, we keep digitizing everything that we like, everything that we value. Mm. We digitize music, whether it's Napster, um, iPods, or uh, Apple Music, Spotify. We, keep, we digitize music. Mm. We digitize yeah. TV shows, Netflix. We digitize movies. Uh, we digitize money. Like, I mean, I could say Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, but actually... I mean, 90% of dollars in circulation are just digital now. So we, we've digitized money with PayPal, Venmo. True. That's interesting. And you, you look at more and more areas. Okay, now we're digitizing art. It's true. And yet, the problem with all these mm, uh, industries has been the scarcity problem. So mm -hmm. music. Oh, the Napster issue of piracy, copying, or right. movie, movie piracy as well. And, you know, the, the artists certainly don't like this. Their stuff gets ripped off, devalued. They don't get credit or pay for it. Uh, but also, audiences like paying when the service is good and uh, to uh, appreciate the creators. Yeah. Most of them happy to. So, like, when people could, like watch free movies on pirate things most people prefer netflix or amazon it's affordable it's good service and they feel they're doing it the right way that's true actually that reminds me another thing about the nfts that's interesting too well first of all it's like really hard to like um crack or whatever so like you own the nft and it's like very difficult for um any pirating or whatever you know like it's really kind of solid in that way and then also like there's that whole secondary market thing where once you sell an nft of your art and then if it like resells you it's basically a contract that's that's the other thing that an nft is is like a contract right like so um you kind of can write into the contract that every time there's a resale you get like a certain percent say 10 to 20 percent i think is pretty normal isn't it maybe even 20 percent is pretty normal and that's like a pretty high, you know, resale number to be getting as an artist, but we don't really get that kind of thing when someone buys one of our oil paintings and then sells it down the road. So there's like a real fairness to the creator in that way. You've jumped straight to one of the, the killer features of NFTs, hmm. which are these royalties. It's a great thing. I, I would kind of wish this could be translated into the traditional art world. Yeah. And Resold paintings could uh, give some kind of uh, returns to the original artist. It'd be really cool. Mm -hmm. But we have that in the digital world. And you said the, the key word there, contract. Mm -hmm. um, like each NFT is, we can go as technical as you want, but you probably don't want to too much. But in yeah. the, in the, <laughs> created within a smart contract. And so each smart contract can hold one or ten hundred thousands of NFTs in it. So that actually, is interesting the, too. The, the, the usual word that people use is collection. But technically, a collection is a smart contract underneath the hood. Huh. That's that's interesting. Um, yeah, and and yeah, there's like so many ways of doing NFTs too. So um, yeah, I mean, I'll just share with everyone. So yeah, I totally agree with you. Like, okay, so I joined Instagram a little late and was slow at it and it took me forever to build my Instagram account. So then when TikTok started happening, I was like in there, <laughs> I was like, there's no way I'm going to be left behind this time. Um, and I kind of felt the same with NFTs and it's really confusing to like try and figure out how to make an NFT. Like I felt like a wizard figuring this stuff out. It was so hard. Um, but there, and there's like a lot of like, um, we, like, like kind of unnatural things, that, steps that you have to do. Like you have to make a wallet and choose what kind of thing to use. Like I use MetaMask and then you have to open your platform and maybe choose which one. And, you know, I used OpenSea and then you have to figure out how to auction it, like whether to have it a set like a limited time frame and what number to put. There's just like so many decisions. And I probably made a lot of them wrong. And I also was 
worried about how it would be perceived in the traditional art world. So I was like, well, I'm just going to use like kind of a fake name, like Christy Schmisty instead of Christy Gordon. It's not that hard to figure out. Anyone who knows me on Facebook knows the connection, but um, and it, yeah. And so there was like some hesitancy, you know, and stuff. Um, and anyway, so my first NFT like totally didn't sell and it actually cost me quite a bit of money to make because I was using Ethereum and everything. Um, but it still gave me like I, you you and I have talked before and you you sort of mentioned this idea that to get into making NFTs, you really just have to get your hands dirty and just get in there. And that was what I gained from it is like understanding a little bit more about it by just having done it. But now <clears throat> I can see all the mistakes I made and how useful it would be to have someone like you who knows the best way and really focuses on how traditional artists can like do this most successfully. What are some of the ways that you think are you know, the best <clears throat> choices along <laughs> along that journey to make for some of these steps. <laughs> uh, hey, congratulations, Christy, for <laughs> Thanks. No, and, and we agree that getting your hands dirty is the way to learn this. Yeah. But it can take a lot of time, and there's such a plurality of options. Oh, so many. It's a, little, it's a bit different to Instagram or TikTok, where it's like, yeah. okay, here's, here's the app. Now you create a reel or right. TikTok. No, instead it's like, wait, which blockchain, uh, which wallet, um, yeah. which platform? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> totally. And it's all scary too, because you're like, oh my God, the wallet, like this money. <laughs> oh, <that's scary>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, this is the double-edged sword of uh, having control of your own money, ownership of your own art, uh, this is the whole ethos of what is called Web3 or crypto or NFTs. Now, it's supposed to be empowering creators. Yeah. But the other side of it, that coin is, oh, we have to do everything myself and figure it all out myself. And, oh, my God, I've got a million options. All right, yeah. So. It sounds like so, you have figured out a really good way, though. Like, um, you know, I, I've taken your course and it's, like, really good. And, um, yeah, I mean, it just opened my eyes to possibilities that I never had found. So, yeah, definitely. Um, well, I mean, I really recommend that to everyone, but yeah, I'd love to hear you share about some of the best techniques that you've found, some of the best choices among these many, well, many uh, choices. Look, I personally, I've tried so many things of, from using I don't know, many of the platforms to writing contracts directly to the blockchain. Mm. And, and then working with artists, both one-on-one -on -one and leading the NFT bootcamp, uh, we've done it twice in live cohorts now. Yep. And throughout this process, really narrowed down what I think is uh, solid, um, simple, and yep. low friction way for artists to get started. Yeah. But, but I want to be clear, it's a starting point. You get yep. your hands dirty, you get to make your first NFTs, and then it opens you up to, oh, there's many more possibilities beyond this. But hey, you've you've created your first, you've got over that hurdle. Yeah. And then you're free to explore and play beyond that. Totally. Right, to really answer your question, and it's it's what I teach in the NFT bootcamp, is there's a, there's a two networks actually on OpenSea, which is the largest NFT platform. One is Ethereum, which you used, and how much did it cost you to get started? It was like about 200 or maybe $250. Maybe it was $200. Okay. I mean, it's not, it's not thousands, but if yeah. you're not sure what you're doing and you're like, oh, I'm just trying this out. I'm not really sure. That can make you hesitate a lot, I think. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, it was, yeah. I mean, it's not a lot of money, but then when it doesn't sell, you're like, oh, that sucks. <laughs> yeah. <I feel> <laughs> So I, I advocate or I encourage artists to use the other blockchain, which That's is what blew my mind. the other blockchain is called, called Polygon and it behaves exactly the same. Amazing. You use the same wallet, you use OpenSea just the same, like everything's the same, except it costs you nothing. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> so once you've tried that on Polygon and they're, they're legit NFTs, Polygon network actually keeps growing in uh, use and adoption and value. So it's totally legit. Yep. More and more artists are using yep. it. So you can just stay with that. Or if you feel confident and 
you want to make more, then you you literally flick one switch, <laughs> oh, change one so little good. setting, and you're over on Ethereum network, you do the same thing. Yeah, yeah, that's what's amazing. You can still use MetaMask, you can still use OpenSea. It just happens to have cost you nothing. <laughs> um, and I mean, and yeah, I can imagine for anyone listening, they're already like, what are you guys even talking about? Like MetaMask, <laughs> OpenSea, like you've already lost me. And that's why you have to make your first NFT. Like that's why I even understand it. Because before that, it's just like so calm. I don't know. You just, your mind fogs over every time you hear the word MetaMask or OpenSea. <laughs> but um, yeah. So, so what other things have you discovered are like the best choices along that journey? Well, I recommend taking a linear path to keep it simple with strong recommendation of like this well trusted tools, which is the MetaMask wallet, even though there's many wallets. Yep. OpenSea. Yeah. Biggest platform, even though there are many platforms and it's yep. not perfect. I don't want to say it's the best or anything, but it's good and well used. Yeah. And then and then Polygon Network, because it's free, so you you're relaxed about it. Totally. And also, many, many people have a concern about the environment, which yeah. I can talk a lot about. But when it comes to NFTs and the environment, it's just that blockchains use computing power. Computing power uses lots of electricity. And that's all the Ethereum network and the Bitcoin network. The little po polygon network uses very little electricity. So if you want to offset the carbon for it, you plant a bit less than 10,000 trees. And that will offset all the carbon for the entire Polygon network for one year. And good news, a company already did it. So it's Aww. all taken care of. It's offset. That's cool. So yeah. th that, might, that might help take away some friction too. If you feel a little, um, the word, uh, split or conflicted, like, oh, maybe this isn't good for the environment, then just like, you can relax about the cost of minting and the, co the cost to the environment and, yeah. and just play and just digital stuff. It's like so cool to hear about that. Is Polygon somewhat new? Cause I mean, I did like um, some research but there was a lot to research. So I, I never like heard about Polygon when I was trying to figure things out. Is it, is it kind of new or, um, or not, not too much? Believe th three years, of, it's been around for approximately three years. Cool. It changed the name. At, from Matic to Polygon for whatever mm -hmm. reason, had a, a brand pivot. I'm in touch with the, the team directly for the company. Yep. They work. They work for an NFT company. Chat to the Polygon team. Oh, they're really, really active, building fast. They're yeah, they're increasing. They're growing well. It sounds really good because, and I think we should probably like move on from the complicated sounding stuff because people just like <laughs> probably can't even hear it. I remember I couldn't like, you just don't understand until you do one, but um, just to kind of throw that out there, I remember that, that I was also learning about hit ek nun or nunk or something. <laughs> and, and that seemed to be another, but the problem was that it was another platform as well as another money form. And, and I don't think that that's ideal. I think, and not that open is the best. I mean, really better would be to be like on net nifted get, gateway or whatever or something like that but that's like curated and hard to get into so open sea is like really good um and i just don't know if there's as many i don't know i didn't know if like hit at knock would be kind of as good or something well i'll, I'll jump in there because i know we're for perhaps for audience new to this we are mentioning lots of new terms yeah but the one you're naming is another another platform another nft marketplace oh okay which is on, which has an impossible name. <laughs> is yeah, on the, terrible the name. Tezos <laughs> Network, another blockchain. Oh, oh right. Hey. Overall, overall, there's this, there's two styles of NFT platforms. There is permissioned and permissionless. Right, right, permissioned yeah. Mean, permissioned means you need to apply or be invited or yeah. you need to say, please, please, can I put my art on your platform? Yeah, and that might sound familiar to the traditional fine art world. True, it's like oh, I got represented by a gallery. Yes, it's exclusive. Totally. And so yeah, yeah, something like Super Rare Nifty Gateway has this air of exclusivity. Yeah, hey, if, if you like that, I mean, if you get on there, power to you because you seem exclusive. Personally, I'm all about um, freedom, decentralization. Right. 
True. cutting out the middlemen. I think that's what this movement is about. True. And you'll find that those those permission platforms take very high fees. You'll oh. find as well. The is it like 50 other, 50 like a gallery or is it like oh, I've, I've never seen that high uh, yeah 15 percent yeah seems, seems to prevail on these large platforms that's yeah and it's really hard to get into them i mean yeah uh yeah and that's what is good about open sea yeah um but yeah maybe yeah. we should move on from all the <laughs> concepts or all the different okay. words uh, well, or uh, but if you have anything else, thought, yeah. like the other ones are permissionless. Anyone can right, use right. Place. Anyone can use Rarible, uh, and we're seeing some new ones now. I don't want to just throw out more names, but these tend to take two percent, two point five percent fees, and 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 to complete the whole thought, the block the blockchain is free to use. You can you can use it yourself without these platforms, and you pay zero percent fees. But you might need a little bit of technical help for that. To yeah yeah and so yeah i mean really like when we're just getting started with nfts we're probably looking at the permissionless like platforms and um and so yeah and so listeners can already see how many options there are and how many choices along the road so i just like um would have i mean i kind of wish that i had had your guidance back when i was making my first one but i'm gonna probably do another one soon and i'm sure it'll go better um christy yeah if I can ask you a question, yep. why don't you think it went well? Do you mean it didn't sell? It yeah, I guess it was just because it didn't sell. I also like, um, like, I'm not sure. I still am actually not sure. Like, so I was, I was doing a lot of research, which I keep saying over and over again. I seem to be a broken record about that, but I was like, do I just do like a JPEG, like a photo, like a high res TIFF file of a painting that I've done, make that an NFT, or do I want to like, do something a little bit different. What I ended up deciding to do is um, minting a one of the videos, the process videos that I have on Instagram of me painting a painting. And then in the bonus content, which um, you can include in your NFT as an extra feature, um, the bonus content was a TIFF, a high res TIFF of the painting. Um, and so I just don't know if it, I think a lot of my decisions were kind of like, because I was a little bit unsure about how the art world would perceive a traditional artist making an nft so the fact that i you know made it like um a process video of one of my sort of study feature study paintings instead of one of my like real oil paint like my gallery pieces and the fact that i did it under a fake name and then i hardly ever mentioned it on instagram because i was like oh what are people gonna think i mentioned it on tiktok or not not tiktok on um Twitter because there's a lot of NFT community on Twitter, um, but I don't have myself like a lot of art community on Twitter. So I was like, well, that's probably better. Um, and so I think all like all of that was kind of making it so I wasn't marketing it well. I mean, yeah, I feel like because it didn't sell, I feel like it didn't go well, but I also just don't actually think that many, maybe most of the decisions that I made of my own accord to the best research that I could do all alone I don't really actually think any of them were like the best choices. Like I used Ethereum, I should have used Polygon. I um, probably didn't need, shouldn't have used a fake name. I wasn't trying to hide it per se, but I just, and yeah, I don't know. Um, and I don't know if even like the choice in what I decided to make as the NFT was like the best choice, you know? Um, so I think it was a really good like learning experience, um, especially because now I understand like, all of these things like steps that you know decisions that and what an nft actually is and it's not just like a weird concept anymore um but yeah i would like to like do one where i've made decisions that feel more like they're the right decisions <laughs> yeah you it, it helps to, if you feel wholehearted about what you're doing mm -hmm. so aligned with it uh Good news is you can go and edit your name on OpenSea. I have already done that since we spoke, actually. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And I can understand your hesitation of what will the art world think, but you might see, you might already know several artists who are doing this. Yeah. And I always suggest to artists, especially when you're starting, to feel, I think it's healthy. You're a little cautious 
that's fine. That's being honest. So you say, I'm not too sure about this, but I've made my first NFT. <laughs> what yeah. do you guys think? It's humble. It's genuine. People can relate to that. Yeah. It's not, it's not braggadocious. It's not saying, <laughs> now I'm an NFT artist. It's like, hey, I'm an artist and I've just tried my first NFT. What do you think about NFTs? Yeah. <laughs> it's a really humble and uh, human uh, approach. Yeah. And if I'm honest, it's a bit of a marketing strategy. Because people engage yeah. with this. Yeah. They say, oh my God, NFTs, they're terrible. <laughs> hey, <that's laughs> <engaging>. <laughs> or they say, oh, I've heard about those. Uh, are, they, are they any good? <laughs> but, but people yeah. Oh, I actually like really like that. And you talk about that a bit in your course too. And I just actually think that that's like, like exactly the right kind of like approach, like the humble honest like not totally sure about this but I made one and I do get behind that because actually I am proud as an artist to be trying to stay on top of the new forms of technology like I'm proud that I figured out TikTok (laughs) you know and I'm not trying to brag I just actually like as an artist it's kind of wild what we have to figure out sometimes like we have to be so smart like and I like that about artists um and so uh, I like that I've like made an NFT and figured it out and stuff, but, um, but I really, I, I mean, yeah. And I like your mention about just like getting behind it. Like, I think um, next time I do one, yeah, I'll like post on Instagram. I'll, you know, I've, when we spoke before too, you like in terms of the marketing strategy strategies that you would suggest for artists, do you want to speak about that? Cause I know, um, you know, we've talked about it a bit before and I really liked Mm. what you said. Happily. Look, no one has all the answers, and I'm not here to pretend that I do either. Everyone's trying to figure it out. Everyone's doing their best. And and actually, everyone's looking at other people going, what does everyone else do? Totally. <laughs> do you, right? Here's, so here's my take on it, which is not the only one. It's not the only, it's not the correct one. But what I, what I believe and what I do see working for artists is that you own it, you put your name on it, yeah, uh, but and you see this as one of your creations. You create a painting, you create a print, you create an NFT. Totally. And so it's part of your creative palette. It's something that you have created. Okay, it happens to be digital. All right. So is a print. True. Right. Totally. Okay. That's true. So. With that in mind, you own it. And then the marketing is that you tell the world about it just the same that you tell the world about your paintings or your prints. Yeah. So for you, that might be your website. It might be your newsletter. It might be your podcast. It might be your Instagram or your TikTok. Yeah. Business. And so if you send out a newsletter to your collectors and your, your community, you might say, well, I'm teaching a new class this month. About what's your next workshop, Christy? Oh, um, well, actually, I don't have a workshop coming up, but I do have an art mentoring program for anyone who's interested. Hey, I'm I'm Christy. I've got an art mentoring program coming up, and uh, I'm working on my new series for uh, coming up for a gallery show. Watch the space, and I have created my second NFT. If you'd like to check it out, there's the link. Yep. And I'm proud to share this with the world. So that's I like totally agree with that. Your yeah. And that's what I saw Jeremy Lipking doing. And it's like, that's, and I'm just like, so happy to have finally seen like a, you know, famous traditional artist <laughs> doing, doing that sort of thing. Cause I couldn't think of anyone back when I was like trying. Um, and um, yeah. And there's uh, like a lot of like, that actually kind of ties in a bit into like some of the decision-making around pricing too. Like, um, and, and also maybe even around, so one of the decisions that I felt was a mistake was that I made it a limited time frame. Like it was like for auction until a certain date, like you have different options when you make an NFT, as far as I understand, and you can have it, correct me if I'm wrong, I might be wrong, but I think you can just have it open. Like it's up for auction, go ahead and buy it anytime now or next year, it's available until it's sold. Or you can make it so it's like, this is on auction until such and such date. And I, for some reason, was like, oh, I should probably like set a certain date. It'll create more like drive. <laughs> but it didn't. That date passed and then it just wasn't sold. And so I still own it. But um, 
I mean, what do you suggest in terms of those particular decisions and, and, and maybe how it ties into like, say how we would view our other work, our oil paintings or whatever art form we do? Absolutely. Again, I don't have all the answers, but I have uh, one recommendation, yep. which I think is a really good starting place, especially if you're not sure about the first way you price it. And then hopefully you find your own pathway from there. Uh, in terms of auction, I think auctions work when there's a lot of demand. Uh-huh. It's probably going to work if really famous artists, they've got multiple people, they expect some bidding. I don't, I don't interact with too many artists like that. Mm-hmm. Someone else. It's got its place. But for most artists, I suggest a fixed price and then it sells when it sells. Ah, a fixed price. Right. So smart. <laughs> See, this is why I need you. <laughs> and then the second question is, of course, what fixed price? You just exactly. pick a number out of the air. And totally. to make it more confusing, it might not be priced in dollars, but in ether. Or if it's on Polygon, it might be in Matic. I'm like, oh, my God. That's <laughs> totally. You can make a simple conversion. Uh, my, my way of framing this is to look at the spectrum of things that you create and sell at the moment. Yeah. And every artist is different, but many artists have some of uh, their standard artworks, some premium artworks, perhaps custom commissions or very large pieces, and then some smaller pieces or some prints or something that's a lower price point. You might have two price points or three points, price points some range like this. And I suggest for your first NFT, because it's digital and it should cost you nothing to create, <laughs> put it at the lower end of that spectrum. Yeah. Uh, where you would pr- play, sorry, where you would price a print or yep. your small size artworks. Yeah, that's, and, that's good. And if that sells, great, power to you. And... Well, you're not going to go down in price. No. You, you could you could price the same, or you could begin to rise that floor. Yep. yep. In this NFT industry term, have a, a rising floor. Love you the rising move floor. Move it up a notch. <laughs> yeah, totally. Exactly like we do in, in oil paintings. Like, I think the idea around oil paintings is to just you know maybe raise your prices five five percent every year. Just, but never you can never lower it. Like you can, so it's you don't want to start too too high because you can. It's really bad if you lower your prices. So just to be slowly raising it over time. Um, yeah, another thing that I was like worried about when I was trying to figure out what to do for my first NFT and get, wrap my head around NFTs is I was like, um, you know, I was thinking, well, should I do like a high res TIFF file of a painting that's already sold? And I know like in terms of legalities, even when a painting has sold and a collector now owns the painting, I still own the copyright. So I was like, you know, technically I know that I would be allowed to do that legally, but I totally worry how a collector would feel if they're like, I own this painting and now she's made an NFT and I don't know if I like NFT, you know? Um, so yeah, what do you, what do you think about that? Like, and I, oh, and then I know Jeremy Lipking, his first NFT. I think he, it was his first. I think he said I could have this slightly wrong, but one of them along the way, um, it was like a collector had bought an original oil painting, and then he wanted Jeremy to create an NFT of it. So he now owns the NFT and the original oil painting. So that's really good. Um, but yeah, what what do you think about that? Like in terms of how collectors might feel about having yeah about something like that. Oh, I think you know. I think you said the answer. Mm-hmm. It, it, it might be legal, but it's all about perception. Yeah. It's just not your right to the owner of the painting. Yeah. And maybe, not, not, maybe not to someone who's looking to buy the NFT either. True. Yeah, totally. I mean, if they know the whole story. So that just doesn't feel quite right. It doesn't. No. But I like your other, you know, idea. I know you've also talked about this idea and I want to try it sometime of actually having an original oil painting and going ahead and making an NFT of it, maybe getting a QR code in your, or you can even get a chip. And then like on the label in the gallery, you know, they would, it would sort of have say the QR code to the NFT. So essentially someone buying the original oil painting would also own the NFT. And you could also type into the NFT contract that if someone buys the NFT, they'll, you know, get the original oil painting too. So that that's kind of like a cool way of doing it. Um, oh yeah, I'm all about this. Yeah, about yeah, I really like this. Yeah. All right, if I, if I can um, 
if I can promote the bootcamp for one second. Yes. Okay. <laughs> the NFT bootcamp covers like three things. We talk all these high level things like marketing, pricing, what fine artists can create, all high level ideas. And we also get to the nitty gritty. Uh, like yeah. Exactly how, how to set up your wallet. Oh, yeah. Step by step, how to mint your NFT. We, we do that. That's essential. <laughs> practical, hands on, getting hands dirty things as well. So it's both of those. And thirdly, and finally, we add on three extra features to make your NFT stand out from the crowd. Yeah. Because it's one thing to make it make it a JPEG, an image, and yep. that's fine. Most NFTs are that. But if you want to stand out, uh, you can do a few things. And you'd, you've mentioned two of them already, actually. Um, yep. Hidden content yep. or unlockable content that only the, the owner or the purchaser of your NFT can, can unlock. It's something you can do digitally, but you can't do in the traditional world. So you're using the magic yeah. feature. That's cool. The second feature we do is putting NFTs within NFTs. Yeah, that's one interesting. Inside the other, like Russian dolls. Yeah. Put as unlimited, as many as you want inside. Whoa. And you, you can also think about it like putting paintings inside a gallery, and the gallery is the NFT, which holds all these paintings inside. Whoa. Just to twist that even more, you can put NFTs inside NFTs. You can also put money, cryptocurrency, inside oh. your NFT. Oh. Okay, so that extra feature. You got to learn the basics first, I recommend. Yeah. And then <laughs> third, the third feature there is what you just described. Yeah. Fusions of physical digital. And I think that's this, cool. this is really powerful for fine artists. Yeah. Because digital artists can't do this. They're like, uh, right. Uh, I True. wish I could bring it to the world. But as fine artists, you've got this amazing talent for painting or sculpture. And then you add a digital component and you link them together. Totally. And um, oh, you just got a couple of ways to link it, which you've mentioned both QR codes or chips called NFC tags, little mm. microchips you can scan with your mobile phone to link them. That's the that's the how, and the why is to give this extra experience. People can have the experience of going into Christy Gordon's next gallery show, scanning the QR code and seeing the NFT. And the NFT could look the same as the painting, or it could be behind the scenes. Uh huh. Well, the process uh, video or process shots, it can add an extra dimension to that artwork. I like and, that. And as I said, you can also link them in the sale. So you, yeah. by one, you get the other. In, in either direction, that can go. Yeah. I mean, I really like that. I had the idea that, like, you could, I take photos of the stages of my paintings. Like, um, so you could even make your NFT, you know, the photos the, of the each of the stages, you know, towards creating the painting. I have a collector who really loved seeing like the stages of his painting painted and um, yeah, or else like the process video or, and the other thing you mentioned in your course, which I think is really true is that like the other benefit of that is that then you sell the painting and you've sold your first NFT because right now I think it might look bad that I have an NFT that was for sale and didn't sell. Like that might actually be like a little bit of a pointing against me now uh, in the NFT world. Um, but it, it looks, it looks good if they look at your OpenSea account and they look to see, well, has she made any other NFTs and they can see like, Oh, there's one, she sold it. Cool. <laughs> Maybe I'll buy this one or whatever. <laughs> totally. Totally. You can you could make that deal that someone buys your NFT, you give them the painting. That's totally legitimate, actually. And and then the sale shows on the blockchain. Everyone can see, okay, the NFT is sold for this price. It's a good head start. It's a good way to get started, and having a an immutable reputation of sales. Yeah. Yeah, it is good. It's it is it's a smart way of doing it. And I think also like, it's a little bit of a, um, like, a, a, I think that this way of having it like um, an original oil painting, say in a gallery linked to an NFT that maybe adds another dimension to the work in some way. Um, you know, I just think that that's something that's interesting. It would be, 
you'd be hard pressed to find someone who thinks that's not kind of cool or whatever. I don't know. Cause I think it is interesting. Um, yeah. Um, and you, yeah, you work at charge particles. I forget. Is that like a platform or is that, uh, and I'm like, I don't know the whole NFT world or is that the discord group or both? Tell us a little bit about that. Oh, sure. Sure. I, yeah, I run artist catalyst as a, consultancy on on instagram and nfts for artists and i also work for charge particles which is a an nft company startup and we have this innovative technology uh so charge Particles there's two things you can look at it like a platform but we aim we aspire to be a protocol which huh. which we hope that we could say all but many many nfts will use Ooh. and the magic that we bring to NFTs is that any, every NFT becomes a basket that can hold things inside it. Ah. Those things are tokens, fungible tokens and non-fungible tokens. Oh. So cryptocurrency, money, and art. That's interesting. I'm actually just thinking of one other thing, and this will be like the last question really, but um, there's also like more and more NFTs that aren't even necessarily art. It could be just like a contract, like you buy this NFT and you get three workshops from me or or you get first dibs on signing up for my limited space workshop or something like that. Like that could be like another option of, apparently that artists could do too. What What do you think about those type of NFTs? Absolutely. Uh, so when, when we, where we started was saying non-fungible tokens are assets that are digital and unique. Right. So there are, in the traditional world, the analog world, there's lots of unique um, non-exchangeable things like tickets mm. to a concert. Yeah. Tickets to a workshop. Or things like this. So we NFTs are seeing more and more applications. Art was the first one. And now it's like a digital land and in-game items for gaming and collectibles and real estate and fractionalized real estate. Real estate. And what am I missing here? Oh, domain names. Oh. Um, it, the use cases keep expanding. Ticketing is a big one that's up and coming. Yeah. Totally. The well, nice I think thing it's... About ticketing is that, okay, it acts as your ticket and it remains a memento. And you can also exchange it with someone else. You can resell, yep. call it scalp, scalping if you like. It's just a derogatory word for reselling your ticket. Um, and it doesn't have to be tied to your name. It's a bearer instrument. Whoever holds an NFT has uh, access. Um, they're also used as access tokens for private groups on Telegram, Discord. Um, oh. They're used as access tokens to private web pages now. Huh. Whoa, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. I am just like so proud of us as artists figuring things out, <laughs> staying on top oh, of technology. Oh. We're wizards. It's amazing what we have to do as artists. People think artists aren't smart, but we're totally oh, smart. <laughs> smart. Power to you. You're <laughs> yes. Like entire businesses in one person. Exactly. Ideators, executors, marketers, yep, accountants. Yeah. Um, oh my god. Technology, everything in one. Totally. And I'm just so glad that now we have like support and figuring out some of these crazy things, like um, yeah, like your NFT bootcamp class and and also like everything you do with Artist Catalyst and like supporting artists with Instagram and things like that. So yeah, can you tell us a bit about where people can find you and some of the classes you offer? Sure. Um, I'm simple to find. Uh, my name is Raphael, but I, I go by Artist Catalyst on Instagram and artistcatalyst.com. And the, the name comes from uh, my chemistry background. My, my doctoral work is in chemistry. And for a long time, I worked in, with catalysts. So I, I like this kind of alchemy, this transformation. Yeah. And that, that's where that name Artist Catalyst came from. I'd like to um, catalyze your art career. Yes, I would like that too. 
Weil Uhr gesagt hast, geht in jemand Instagram on what actually moves the needle, what actually gains followers. Like, yeah. The short version is there's three ways to three ways to grow followers. It's not a big mystery. That's the short version. Yep. I work hands on one on one with artists on this. I also offer the NFT bootcamp, which I've now recorded because we did a few, a few um, live cohorts and then pe people kept asking, like, can I do it now? I'm like, okay, I'm recording this. So yeah. I think that's good. You can get started anytime you want, do it in your own time. Yeah. And come back to the, the videos too. It's amazing. Yeah. And, and also artists then ask about digital marketing and I'm happy to work with them on that from email lists to websites to marketing strategy. Really the sides, like the business side of art. Yeah, it's, it's so great because there's like a lot of stuff to, to figure out and simple things that you might, you know, do on Instagram or with making NFTs and you might just kind of be doing them wrong. And if you just make a little change, if you just know the right way, it could make like all the difference. So I'm so glad that you're, you know, figuring this stuff out and then sharing it with artists and catalyzing their careers and you just make it so accessible and yeah so it's it's really great to have you and um thank you so much for sharing all your knowledge with us and i can't wait to talk to you again soon so thank you so much Raphael, and i'll talk to you soon always good talking with christy bye bye Thanks, Raphael. Bye. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Down to Art. And if you're interested in any of my classes or seeing my paintings, you can check out my work at christygordon.com or look at the online classes I have at christygordoncourses.com where you can learn about my online art mentoring program as well as the different streamed online classes that I have. If you've never taken any of my classes, I would suggest you start with the self-portrait class. So thank you for joining us today.